guys, this is Comic Uno and Comic Frontline, and today I'm doing Comic Uno episode 208, and this is a show where if you all the comics I've read this week in one show, we go worst pick of the week to best pick of the week and everything in between. So let's get started. I have a huge haul this week, which was 25 books. I actually even dropped one book because I'm like, ah, oh, there's a lot to read, and I wasn't so interested in that title. So let's get started, though. Let's go number 25. Worst pick of the week this week was... Detective Comics, issue 964. Um, I just have not been liking the direction of the series. But also, even just uh, structure-wise, I don't think the plot really progresses all that much. Uh, the Clayface story feels like an afterthought, and the Stephanie story is so out of character, and just not what I want to see from the character. She randomly kisses anarchy, she's running off, and in... I understand she has the loss of Tim, but I feel like she feels so much like a two-dimensional character that she's just like jumping to different ships, you know, oh, I want to follow Anarchy, oh no, that's not what I want, I'm going to follow Batman, that's not what I want either. Um, she doesn't really have a, a personality, and I don't love her motives, and I feel like this is very out of character of what we've seen from Stephanie in the past, that she's very much her own character. She will do whatever it takes to save the day, even though people look down at her, and I feel like this could be a really good opportunity to show, no, I do have these different motives, I don't see what Batman's seeing, but I could be my own type of hero, and they're trying that, they're just not really executing it well, so, as proven with the anarchy kiss of this issue, which... Yeah, don't know where that came from. Anyways, Detective Comics issue 964 gets two stars. Even the paneling was a little off too, where the paneling went to one page to the other, and it felt really random the way they chose that. I'm like, wait, okay, I guess I have to go on the next page to read that. Uh, so that was a little off for me too. Anyways, moving on to number 24, which is Wonder Woman issue 30, uh, which is just kind of end of this filler arc, and you really notice it's a filler arc until the end of the story, where Wonder Woman's fighting these government people, the government people lie to Wonder Woman, and that's kind of it. And the, the villains definitely do not feel fleshed out. Uh, and it is just a very forgettable story. So I gave Wonder Woman issue 30 two and a half stars. Moving on to number 23, which is X-Men Blue, issue 11, uh, which I just felt like this issue was really scattered all over the place. So we get um, Madeline Pryor, who's now the Goblin Queen, I think her name is now, uh, and she... She, we get to see kind of projections of all these different people that were affected by um, Limbo, which I thought was interesting, but because we got so many of their mind frames, like, oh, here's Colossus, here's Pixie, uh, it felt really scattered, and they were trying to do way too much in this issue, and it, and, and it didn't really hit home all, all the story I think it should have. So X-Men Blue for me, uh, again, was just a little scattered, so I'm going to give that one two and a half stars, and that is number 23. Now, moving on to number 22, uh, which is Supergirl, issue 13. Now, I think the ending was kind of interesting with uh, Mr. Oz, which we'll definitely talk about Mr. Oz. Now that we know his, his identity, I thought the ending was kind of interesting uh, with, her, with his connection to Supergirl. Uh, but, you know, everything else that's been wrong with this title continues to be wrong. The supporting characters aren't very interesting. Supergirl's motives and personality is not really injected here, so when she's has this epic, epic fight, it doesn't feel like it has a lot of weight, and that was the biggest problem for me throughout the issue. Our work is good, I like the pencils, coloring is still very damp for a Supergirl book, so that's why I'm, why I'm gonna give this two and a half stars. It wasn't the worst issue of Supergirl, but still has the major problems of why I can't fully enjoy this book. Now moving on to the next issue, or the next uh, book, which is number 21, Teen Titans, issue 12. Now, uh, even with this big haul of a week, I did try out Teen Titans on a whim. I haven't been reading the title just because this is not really my Teen Titans team, and I wasn't, not that I didn't dislike it, or not that I was disliking it, uh, it just didn't really have a hook for me. And that continues here. I, I, I picked it up because it's a DC Knights, uh, DC Knights Metal tie-in, and I saw characters I really liked, uh, like Batgirl, Nightwing, teaming up with, uh, with our Teen Titans, so I thought that would be interesting, but the way they throw in everybody felt really rushed, and this didn't really feel like a Teen Titans issue, uh, it's more of a Damien issue of how Damien feels about what we learned in Dark Knights Metal, which is these characters, 
Um, and these metal creatures are actually parts of Batman, so I thought that was cool, but it was done better in Dark Knight's Metal. Uh, but yeah, I just was, didn't feel like a totally necessary tie-in unless you're a huge Damian Wayne fan, because all the other characters kind of just feel thrown in there. So Teen Titans issue 12 gets two and a half stars. Moving on to number 21, I believe. No, number 20, which is Secret Empire Omega, issue 1. So, uh, once again, I say this with every Secret Empire issue, and I don't have to say this anymore because this is the last one. If you've been enjoying Secret Empire, I'm sure you'll like this. It's the ending. You get to see Cap versus Cap, and they get to talk to each other. Um, you get hope that Black Widow's still alive, which, yeah, I think we all knew she would be, and it shows that this event had no stakes. Uh, so you get to see those uh, those type of characters. It, Punisher, you get a little bit more of Winter Soldier. Uh, just seeing where they end up, but for me, as someone who didn't love Secret Empire, I just didn't feel invested in the story, the artwork. Not my thing either, so... Secret Empire Omega issue 1 promises probably more of Hydra Cap, which I don't really want to see, but if you like this event, I guess pick this one up, but uh, it's still not my thing. Alright, moving on to number 19, which is Slam, the next jam, issue 1. And I was a little disappointed with uh, the art change. So Veronica Fish, who I, I enjoy her artwork a lot, uh, was on this title and really enjoyed uh, the creative team here. But we get a new artist, and the coloring is, well, first of all, the art style is kind of weird. It's it's definitely not as as similar to Veronica Fish's art, um, which is, a, I would say, a bit cleaner. Um, and then the coloring was kind of weird, where it's like coloring where you get to see white spots still, and, you know, that's just, uh, it's just a style to use, but I didn't think it worked with this one. It just felt off compared to the original Slam series. Now, I still will pick it up because I, I did enjoy the original Slam series, but I don't think it has the heart that I really liked from that, that first volume. All right, moving on to number number 18, which is Dark Knight's Metal, issue 2, which is another event that I don't feel totally invested in. Um, there's interesting parts, like I really like that panel where Superman tells Batman, hey, you're my brother, and I know your heartbeat just like Lois is, and that's how he knows it's actually a clay face that is pretending to be Batman. And I like the ending, of course. You find out that these metal creatures are all parts of Batman, and that should be interesting to, to read. But a lot of the other stuff are kind of slow action scenes of, like, this is what the Justice League's doing. So getting to that point, uh, for me, could have been more entertaining. I really don't like the exposition of explaining uh, what these metals mean. It does not make me invested in the metals at all by over-explaining about them. So Dark Knight's Metal Issue 2 gets uh, two and a half stars. All right, now we are moving on to number 17, which is Captain Marvel and Car Captain Marvel issue one, Generations. Now, this is a book I was really looking forward to because I don't know much about Captain Marvel. I just didn't read a lot of his stuff, and obviously, he's a character that hasn't shown up in a long time because he did die of cancer, so Marvel hasn't brought back the character. Uh, but I, I was really interested to learn more about him, and I, and I do like Carol. I've read a lot of Carol, uh, but this. I really didn't like the dialogue. Um, I thought the dialogue was extremely cheesy up to the beginning of, of Carol, like, making all these Wizard of Oz puns for, like, three pages. And you have some heart in, like, one or two pages, but I don't think it's enough for how cheesy the dialogue was throughout and how I wasn't as entertaining uh, or entertained with the other characters introduced here. So Captain Marvel issue one, Generations, gets two and a half. I was pretty disappointed with this one. Moving on to number... 16, which is Birthright issue 26, which has kind of always been in the same place for me. It's never that low, but it's also never that high. <laughs> it's just kind of that middle ground book that has a very slow burn, but interesting enough characters that you want to see what happens next. And here it's the same thing. Interesting characters, uh, some interesting conversation, but a very, very slow burn. So, uh, but it's cool to see the family interact and say, what do we do with Mikey? What's next? And, and we get to really see this new chapter begin. So I gave that issue three stars. It's kind of in the middle for me. 
All right, moving on to number 15, which is Sheena, issue one. And I will say I don't love the artwork for this book. Uh, it's not exactly what you expect with the, you know, Jason Campbell cover and some of the other covers we have that is a bit cleaner the art style. Uh, it's very dark and not gritty, but kind of gives this gritty tone uh, to it. So I don't love the color palette, and I think the line work doesn't work very well. It's very thick, the line work. So uh, I think the artwork could be a little bit better, but the story is uh, kind of interesting where we get to see Sheena um, try and protect her, you know, her village. And we see these men say, well, your village killed one of our men and you have to find him in 24 hours to find out what happened. So you kind of have this mystery of what did happen to this guy and who did kill them. And Sheena has to go throughout the jungle to, to find this guy. So it, it's, it's a, Interesting enough story for me to want more. I don't know if there's a huge pull to say, yes, this is an amazing Sheena book. But like I said, it, it's kind of interesting to, to learn more about the character. And there's enough of enough pull to say, all right, I'll pick up the next issue. So Sheena issue one gets three stars. Moving on to number 14, which is all new Wolverine issue 24, which overall was kind of a filler arc, but there's some moments I enjoyed here. Uh, really, Gabby getting out of the brew and everyone being shocked, like, wow, how did she do that? And, and Laura really not giving up on Gabby was nice. Don't know how to feel that Jonathan could talk now. I don't really want that, Jonathan the Wolverine. I like that he was just like this cute pet. I don't know if I need talking, uh, talking Jonathan, but... Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a forgettable team up with the Guardians of the Galaxy, but it gave you enough of Gabby and Laura to say, I guess it was worth picking up. It was just kind of a longer arc than it needed to be. I think this could have easily been two issues, but they were just prolonging for Marvel Legacy. So all new Wolverine issue 24 gets three stars. And also the artwork was very cartoony and, and sometimes um, a little messy. Alright, moving on to number 13, which is Venomverse Issue 2. A little lower than Issue 1, I think Issue 1 had a little bit more to offer, but there's still some fun interaction between this version of Peter Parker as Venom and Eddie Brock, and, and even Mary Jane and Peter. There were some moments there I really liked. Like how uh, Peter called MJ the damsel in distress, and that's all she's good at. And then also... MJ going straight to Peter's face is a face of tiger. So those are fun moments. Artwork is gorgeous for this book. But the thing I didn't like were the armored venom. Like, where did that come from? I, I think the mythology needs to be dug a little bit deeper over at this book to kind of understand what's been going on with Venomverse. But there's interesting character moments enough to, say, to definitely make this worth a, a read. So Venomverse issue 2 gets 3 stars. Moving on to number... 12, I'm sad to see this so low because I love this arc, but I didn't love the ending, and that was Ms. Marvel issue 22. Um, I've been loving the Mecha arc. I love the reveal of Josh being in Discord, but all of that like fizzles away in this last part where we get to see more of the community aspect, which I love about Ms. Marvel, but there wasn't enough Ms. Marvel in the community interacting with Ms. Marvel. And it's a lot of Ms. Marvel just kind of being down on the dumps, which, you know, I understand why she is. But I think this issue would have done better for me if it was more between Discord and, and Ms. Marvel. That's what made last issue so good is that conversation between the two. And you really just get to see Josh walk away and that's it. You don't really get to see a big powerful moment between them. And it's like kind of just leaves you on a cliffhanger with them. It's like, oh, I guess we'll see them again later. And when happens to Josh but you gotta have to wait a while and it doesn't really conclude their story at all and then it also shows how much jailbreak uh and I think her name's jailbreak I always get it wrong um let me see lockdown see I always call her jailbreak her name's lockdown um lockdown uh is also just a whiny villain. Like, once she doesn't have Discord, who was the most interesting aspect of this arc, uh, she just, like, whines away and is like, oh, it's all Miss Marvel's fault. And, and she's definitely not a strong villain. So overall, I gave this three stars. It's not a bad issue. There's still some fun moments with Miss Marvel, but I, I definitely expected more because I really love this arc other than this issue. So Miss Marvel issue 22 gets three stars. Moving on to number 11, another book I loved last issue, but it fizzled with this one, and that's Superwoman issue 14. A beautiful uh, cover, though. Now, I love the last issue of Superwoman. Definitely the best of the series. But then, 
it just kind of like wraps itself up off panel where in the in the last issue we get to see Supergirl and Lana going against each other and Lana is being brain controlled by or mind controlled by the red the red kryptonite because of her powers and in her involvement with red kryptonite as a teen that's what ended up happening uh, happening and then in this issue is like oh well thanks Supergirl for helping me now let's go help Amos and and do that then Maxima kind of randomly comes into the issue where she's She's not even a character in Supergirl right now. She was in the New 52 Supergirl series. So I don't know why Maxima was there at all. She did not fit the story. And the only part I felt like that was really redeemable was Amos. I really liked him as a character where Amos is like, no, you are a superhero. Even, you know, without these powers, you are a hero. So uh, I really liked that Amos was like following Lana's career as Superwoman because they were high school friends. Um, and I thought that was a really cool moment. Our work is solid too. But I was definitely disappointed with this issue because I really enjoyed last issue. And this did not do enough for the Supergirl, Superwoman dynamic that I was expecting. I love Kara and Lana together. And, and they don't really have much chemistry here. They're just kind of hanging out. Uh, but there wasn't a true purpose for them to hang out and, and really get that bond that I wanted. So Superwoman issue 14 gets three stars. I was a little bit disappointed with that one. All right, but let's move on to number 10 which is The Defenders issue 5, uh, which I feel like still tries to fit too much into the issue, but the stuff we do get is pretty solid. I, I like the team actually interacting with each other. I think this is a first, uh, but uh, Brian My Michael Bendis does a good job at it, and I think there's definitely the feel of the TV show in this book. Uh, the Punisher Diamondback stuff was okay. Um, I guess it was cool that they interacted, but I didn't love the dialogue there. But it was a cool ending with Diamondback, like, killing or at least shooting Black Cat. That was an interesting cliffhanger. Uh, so yeah, I gave this one three and a half stars. It's still not the series I want it to be, but it, it was a fun enough read. So Defenders issue 5 gets, uh, three and a half stars. Now it's number 10. Moving on to number number 9. And I know you guys are going to be surprised. This is a little lower, but Action Comics issue uh, 987. Now, I did like the cliffhanger. It was my second, uh, my second guess of who Mr. Oz was. Spoiler alert, we find out Mr. Oz was uh, Jor-El. So, I mean, I think... It was either Ozzy Medeus or Jor-El. That's what I thought. And and that's what happened. And, and I feel that it's interesting to see what Jor-El's motives are and, and why he hates humans. Uh, and I guess because he's just been watching the world. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to see that and, and see his connection with the Superman family other than just Clark. Uh, and what happens next with that. And, and why he's so involved with the rest of the DC Universe. Uh, but I feel like leading up to there, it, it was just like, oh, here's a regular day in Superman's life. All right, let's go to Mr. Oz. And I feel like the pacing was really off for that. And that's why this was a little lower for me. And also, um, the artwork was good. I did enjoy the artwork, though. I thought the artwork was, was good. Um, but I think it was so much about leading up to the cliffhanger that the rest of the issue didn't have as much meat as I, as I wanted. So Action Comics issue 97 gets three and a half stars. Now, moving on to number eight, a book I was really surprised by this week, and that was The Amazing Spider-Man issue 32. Now, I haven't been loving The Amazing Spider-Man's current arc, but I like this one-off, one-shot issue where the artwork changes, it's a bit darker, and I love the paneling here, too. It's a bit somber, the issue, where we get to see... What has been, uh, what has, uh, Norman Osborn been up to? We haven't seen him in a while, and, and how does he become Green Goblin again? And it's a pretty cool story. Uh, I, it doesn't give you that much character moments, uh, as in, like, oh my god, I can't wait for Green Goblin. But I think it gives you enough that at least you get some meat of why, obviously, how Green Goblin came back. And like I said, I, I like the way this issue was structured and, and I thought it was a better issue than what we've been getting and I was pleasantly surprised by it. So Amazing Experiment issue 32 gets three and a half stars. Moving on to number seven, 
which is Titans issue 15 and this was definitely one of the better Titans issues we've gotten in a while where we you know quickly figure out why Dick Grayson was a double agent but really what I loved about this issue was Wally where you get to see him writing this letter to Dick Grayson all the time and saying no matter what if you need me I'll be there and and he wants to quit being Flash because obviously his powers are um, hurting him and by the end he, he saves Dick Grayson and gets stabbed so is he dying? Probably not, but it's a cool sacrifice moment, and I liked how the letter was uh, structured throughout the issue of what's been going on with Wally, and also this issue kind of felt more like a team issue, where that's been a complaint either, they've been focusing way too much on one character, but I feel like this issue really focused on all the characters and them being a family slash, you know, friends, so I, I enjoyed that aspect. So Titans issue 15 gets a solid four stars. Moving on to number six, which is a Mr. Miracle issue two, uh, which I've been pleasantly surprised by this book, or maybe not even surprised because it's Tom King, but I definitely interested in it. I've never really read the New Gods or were interested in the New Gods unless they showed up somewhere else, but I never really went venturing for the New Gods. And I will say that might take a little bit out of the experience that I am not a hardcore New Gods fan, but still there's some really interesting moments of Mr. Miracle being paranoid, you know something's been going on with his head, but what I like the most here is Big Barda in his relationship, where you get to see that they're separating a bit, the way they're, you know, interacting with each other. They're not as romantic as they could be. Uh, so you get to see there's something putting a, you know, severing their relationship and, and why is their relationship suffering. Uh, and then in the end you get to see uh, Big Barter make a big move of killing, uh, I think it was Granny Goodness who, who died. Um, let me see. Yeah, it was Granny Goodness, which Granny Goodness was so creepy and exactly what you want from her. And I also liked how kind of insecure Big Barda was throughout the issue, where all she could really say to uh, Mr. Miracle after he says, you're beautiful. She's like, I'm too tall. And then even Granny Goodness says, oh, you're amazing. You're, you're beautiful. And she's like, no, I'm too tall. Um, so I like those moments. It humanizes these godlike characters. So Mr. Miracle issue two gets a solid four stars. Moving on to number five, uh, a book I was really surprised by this week, and that was Batgirl in the Birds of Prey issue 14. And this issue was just fun. That's all I have to say. Um, it was fun. Our work was pretty good, too. There's times where it was a little messy, the style, but overall I, I liked it. Um, but I like this issue because we get to we get to see it open with Barbara just being Oracle and her helping out Batman, which is amazing that Batman called her and, and wanted help from Barbara. I don't think we get to see those two interact enough. And then it's the, the rest of the Birds of Prey. It's uh, Huntress and Black Canary going off and helping out some of Huntress's students or just going camping, uh, having a regular day and being tourists, which was fun. And then Barbara switches off and becomes Batgirl and she has this long day teaming up with Catwoman and Poison Ivy, who are kind of like new members of the Birds of Prey from the latest arc. And then by the end, you just get to see the three hanging out as friends. Uh, it's a simple issue, but it does a lot for Birds of, uh, Birds of Prey fans. You know, it it, it solidifies their friendship. It's uh, showing Barbara can be both Oracle and Batgirl, which I think Barbara, Barbara Gordon fans could definitely be happy about uh, because... Some Barbara Gordon fans like her as Batgirl more, some like her as Oracle, here she's both. So I definitely like that aspect, and overall it's just a really fun issue. So I like that it kind of goes back to the roots of why we like Birds of Prey. So Batgirl and the Birds of Prey issue 14 gets uh, four stars. Now that's number five. Now we're moving on to number four, which is... Hulk, issue 10. Glad to see this in my top five again. It was a little lower for, for a time, but it's back. Uh, and I love that it goes back into the psychological storyline with, uh, with Jen. And I love this, like, kind of tongue-in-cheek line where this whole issue is about Jen talking about the book Frankenstein, how she read it, and obviously how her story is very similar to Frankenstein. And I love the tongue-in-cheek moment where she says, well, in the book, halfway through, the monster shows up. And it's only halfway through until the monster shows up. Where I know a lot of people have complaints where it's like, where's Hulk? Where's Hulk? It's like, be patient. Be patient. There's a reason 
reason why we haven't seen Hulk the way we have. So I like that moment. We obviously do get to see more Hulk moments here. Um, but yeah, I like the comparison of her and Frankenstein and, and why she read that book and, and the comparison of Frankenstein and Bruce and, and how he was a scientist. So love that. Love the narration here. Um, but also I think there's a really nice full circle moment with uh, Oliver where Jen kind of goes all out. She becomes the monster she most fears and really Oliver is the symbolization of the monster that she most fears uh, because she goes all out and, and makes him unconscious and he ends up in the hospital exactly like she was in the hospital after Civil War II with Thanos. So she kind of becomes her own worst enemy in so many ways. There's so many layers to that. She's her own worst enemy because of the monster inside but also because of what she does to Oliver. Uh, so I really like the def definition of what is a monster and, and Jen really uh, figuring that out. Uh, my only disappointment with this issue, I would say, is uh, the artwork change. I thought the, the first artist was really good getting this more horror-esque um, art style to the book, but then it changes to like this cartoonier style, which didn't quite work as well. So uh, that's my only nitpick of the issue, but I did really enjoy this one, so I gave that four stars. Now moving on to number three, which is Kill or Be Killed, issue, uh, issue 12. Uh, and once again, the dialogue for this book is, is so genius. I, I love the beginning where, where um, our main character is describing why we're fearful and, and the line that we kind of put for ourselves for fear. And as the issue goes on, we get to see him um, build more of a relationship with Kira, you know, his kind of girlfriend, uh, but definitely childhood friend. And then him just going down the line trying to kill the Russian mob and figuring out more about them because they know, you know, a bit about his identity. So uh, definitely it moves the plot pretty well. It's still a little bit of a slow burn, but the dialogue is so good and so interesting to just get into this character's head. So Kill or Be Killed issue 12 gets four stars. Moving on to number two, which is a book I've been loving, and that is Baby Teeth issue four. And once again, just another great issue with uh, with plot progression and character moments, where we get to see our main character tells her dad that she, you know the whole story about her her baby being like a demon, and her dad does not believe her. She, you know he obviously thinks she has something psychologically wrong with her until we get to see the assassin chasing them and and you don't know what happens to the father at all because we have to see our main character leave she runs away uh and then we also get to see her sister sees that this guy has her, uh, um his guts going out of his uh out of his stomach so she sees something's going on and she's brought into the water so there's a lot of cliffhanger moments in this issue where you wonder is our main character's family going to be alive by the end honestly the way she talks it doesn't seem like they will be but really interesting character moments and good plot progression like i said so baby teeth issue four gets four and a half stars Moving on to my number one pick, which is Runaways issue one. I'm a huge Runaways fan, and I really enjoyed this issue. Now, I will say it is a slow burn because we don't get to see all the Runaways characters. You don't get to see Molly or Carolina in this issue, but the issue gives a reason, a reasoning of why it's a slow burn. It's about introducing the exciting incident of Gert coming back to life, and I like that Nico is the point of view here, because Nico is the character we've seen the most from uh, all the other Runaway characters. We've seen the other Runaway characters here and there, but not as much as Nico, especially because she was in A Force. So uh, it was nice to see her, and then also see kind of how insecure she's been um, over these past couple, and alone she's been over these past couple of years so I and I love that line where it's like oh what does her you know I have to find it um it's a really good line uh let me see so what do you call a runaway with nowhere left to go alone so I I like that you know the runaways originally was about these teenagers finding a family and now it's about these kids who are now adults and and what does that mean their family has kind of been separated does the family come back together and how does the family come back together and what does that mean for that relationship and i think that's going to be a big push of what this series is about and it does a really good job with chase and nico especially here their dynamic is really well done um 
And also bringing a lot of cool old school elements like uh, her not having her robotic arm anymore. Uh, her also not being so confident about her magic even after all these years she doesn't really know how to use it uh, correctly because her parents never taught her. And that goes back to, oh, uh, evil parents are still in the storyline. Uh, even as adults they're still kind of putting a weight on Nico's shoulders. So a really well done issue. Artwork is gorgeous too by Chris Enga. Really great collaboration. Uh, so... I'm stoked to read more, and Molly and uh, Carolina are actually my two favorite characters from Runaways, especially Carolina, so I'm really stoked to see their characters, but I thought this was a really good start, um, so I gave this one four and a half stars, and that was my pick of the week. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic You Know and Comic Frontline. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Don't forget to like my Facebook page. Also, description below, there are links for my comic book, Like Father, Like Daughter. And don't forget to like the Facebook page of Like Father, Like Daughter. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.